Brian is someone who's been very supportive to the Venture Forum for uh, many years. So I heard Brian speak last year on IP um, on a panel. And um, I thought he was excellent and gave a lot of very good and practical information. So he was one of my first choices for tonight. He's the chairman of his practice. He has a new firm. It's about a year and a half, two years old. He himself has um, over 20 years of experience. So take it away, Brian. So I'm going to start off with some basics and talk about the different types of intellectual property. And I really, before I even start there, I honestly, I had never met Kringle before tonight. I want to say he did a great job in giving a perspective of an entrepreneur and the patent system. And you've learned a tremendous amount. You must have a great attorney. I know the, some of the attorneys at Morris, Barnes, Brown, and Pendleton, and they really are good. Um, and you did a nice job explaining it. So, uh, you know, the, 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 an educated client for me is a great resource and wonderful to work with. And I'm sure you're great to work with. Um, and I wish you the best of luck. But you can take a lot of lessons from, from what Kringle went through. And he offered that I could use him as an example if I wanted in my talk. And, um, you know, I may do that a bit. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Kringle uh, talked only about patents. I'm going to talk about the four types of intellectual property just briefly. Um, the main focus in you know, the technology world is typically patents, but um, I, I want to kind of just review the landscape very, very briefly. So what is intellectual property? It's basically uh, a, a right to prevent someone else from, from using your property. It doesn't necessarily give you the right to use the property, as I think Kringle uh, discussed briefly. Um, and importantly, once you have a property right, um, you can uh, disposition that. You can use it. You can let others use it through licensing, or you can sell it to others, or you can collaborate around it in, um, in many different ways. Um, and what fascinates me about intellectual property um, and wh why I love the field so much as, an, as a kind of a former engineer is that I get to sit down with someone like Kringle who is really an expert in, in a field, usually a narrow slice of some field, very deep knowledge. And um, I love the uh, interaction and the learning that, that I can go through myself and so I, I feel like I'm a repository of these crazy little bits and pieces of technology all over the place. And I think I have some facility for understanding it and translating into, into patentees. Um, but w the reason I'm saying this is that intellectual property is created from ideas and it turns into a real property right that can be worth a lot of money. And we'll hear about the money side in a few minutes. I don't know much about valuation of patents, and I'm fascinated to hear the next talk. Um, but what's amazing to me is that something just came out of your mind, your creation, can now be turned into cash, essentially. I think it's very, very exciting. That's really, at the, at the heart, why I like the field so much. Um, thinking about um, intellectual property strategically is uh, critical, as, as Kringle mentioned, they got into the strategic side a little bit after they started down the path, which is very, very normal. Um, but um, I, th I think of intellectual property as assets, um, and your company is essentially creating them. You're paying money to create them. And um, at, at a minimum, you need to think about whether the asset's worth the investment. And then, you know, why does my company, my venture, need this asset? What's it going to do for my company? Is it going to prevent competitors from, you know, directly competing with me? Is it going to give me some other position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a third party? Um, what exactly is the purpose of this intellectual property? And you should have those discussions and make decisions, smart decisions, based on around your business plan um, before you dive into it, uh, which Kringle didn't do. 
Um, very few people do initially, and probably doesn't make a lot of sense where you're starting down the path and you have a technology and you know that's where you're going, so you file the patent application and then you figure it out after that, which again uh, is, is very, very common. So some of the purposes of the IP strategy are listed here. I don't have to read the, si the slide. I have a fair number of slides, so I want to make sure I get through them. Um, here's, again, it's a brief overview of essentially the four types of intellectual property. Um, patents, um, a, a patent is an exclusionary right. It gives the patent owner the right to prevent any other party from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing the patented invention into the country. Uh, patents are always at the end of the day, territorial. Even starting with the PCT, you're gonna end up with a bunch of national patents. Um, there are some regional systems like Europe, but essentially patents cover a, a country and give rights in that country. Um, I'm gonna mention trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets kind of real briefly. I think I'll focus on patents. Um, I have some other remarks on these other types of IP. But if people have questions about them, I, I can answer them or maybe sit down in a mentoring session and, and talk about them in a little more depth. Um, but um, they should all be considered. Um, trademark is you know, a product or service name. And I would argue that every company which is in business has a trademark or maybe more than one. And a lot of companies really don't think of them. Um, but it, it, it can be highly important, especially when you're the first to market with some thing, <laughs> to use your term, item, whatever it is, service. Uh, you give it a good name, and that then creates, as it's used, creates goodwill and value around that trademark. And um, having the trademark is another way to protect your position. It doesn't protect at all what the item is, but it protects the name of the item a la Coca-Cola, that's the example I like to use. Uh, you can drink RC Cola and Coca-Cola and they probably taste pretty similar, but Coca-Cola brand is worth billions of dollars and RC Cola's brand is probably worth a lot less than that just because of the longevity and the amount of advertising oomph that's been behind it that's built up this value. So don't overlook um, trademarks if you're gonna sell a product or a service. Um, Copyright is a completely different animal. Um, we're all familiar with copyright. Uh, it protects an expression of an idea that's been reduced to some tangible form. So these slides I wrote, for example, are, are copyrighted property of my law firm uh, because they're, they express some ideas that we had and they're reduced to a tangible form and my firm owns a copyright in these slides, which means that neither you or anyone else can copy them. Um, and again, that's a, that's a right that now my firm owns and we could license or sell or use with other parties um, in, in different ways. Um, and the last form of intellectual property is uh, trade secret, um, which is uh, a much different animal, a, a, a trade secret is um, really the definition of a trade secret is information that gives a venture a competitive advantage that isn't generally known in the industry. Um, classic example is your customer list or the Coca-Cola formula. There's another good example. Um, so trade secrets are owned because no one else knows them. And if steps are taken to keep them secret, they can last forever, unlike a patent, um, and they can be very valuable, but they're not useful if your trade secret can be essentially reverse engineered because it's only valuable when it's in fact a secret. Um, a little bit about, I'm sorry, yeah? I'll, I'll repeat the question. He asked if, uh, if copyright exists essentially when um, a, a document is written or, or copyrighted work is, is created? The answer is yes. When a copyrightable work is, is put onto paper or in some, some 
form, then there is in fact a copyright and it's owned by the author or authors unless there's some agreement to transfer ownership. Um, and that, ownership, that copyright exists without taking any formal steps. I put the notice on these slides um, in part because I wanted to provide a little lesson. I don't really care if anyone copies these slides. Um, but the notice now tells people, oh gee, someone in fact does own it. Whereas if there's no notice, you know, the, the logical presumption is that nobody owns it like everything on the web that everyone thinks is free. It gets very interesting. Um, there is a copyright registration system and the rights are expanded and perfected and sometimes important that are granted by the registration system, but it's not necessary to register a copyright in order to own it. Unlike a patent, where a patent has to be filed within a certain time period and has to be seen through the patent office, what's called prosecution, to the issuance of a patent before there's any right. Okay? Yep. Uh, did I skip this one uh, a little bit? Um, I kind of talked about this already. I don't think I need to go into it anymore. Um, this slide tries to give a sense as to kind of the flow uh, considerations of IP in a company. Um, it's, it's a continuum here, really. Um, typically, I would say this, the starting point is really around the competitive intelligence and strategic planning. Um, I'll use Kringle as an example again. Um, his competitive intelligence at the beginning was based just on your knowledge in the field, and you certainly have a deep expertise in a really particular field. And so I'm sure you felt that you had something new just based on your own experience. Um, and that's very common with inventors. And most times with inventors who are technically capable and experienced in the field, that tends to be right. When it isn't right is when you get um, you know, a homeowner developing a new mop that has never worked in the mop field, and the chances are that mop has been invented 28 times, but that person wouldn't know that because they have no experience in the field. So the competitive intelligence helps to understand kind of what you have, you plan around it, develop it, um, create your IP. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, port IP portfolio management in a minute. Um, I'm not gonna talk about enforcement really uh, in any depth, um, I don't think we really have the time. Value extraction, I'll talk about a little bit, um, and our, our last speaker will be talking about that, about that, that um, some more. And this, this now ties into where I'm gonna go next. Um, and it, I've talked about most of this already. Um, I think that one of the main points here uh, to kind of reinforce what Kringle said is that a patent typically takes at least two years to issue, oftentimes three years or more. I've had them pending for close to 10 years. It's highly unusual, but it does happen. The average now in the US is probably two and a half, three years. Um, from the filing of the full patent application to the issuance of the patent. And I'll talk about the patent process probably a little bit more in a second. Um, and uh, an important point to remember is that until the patent is actually issued by the patent office, you do not have enforceable legal rights. So patent pending means that you filed a patent application and hasn't yet issued, you're in the examination um, period. Um, and you do not have the right to go into court and sue a party for infringing your patent pending. You have that right the day the patent issues moving forward. In some cases, you can look back in time for collecting damages, but you don't have the right to enforce, you don't have an enforceable property right in the patent system until your patent issues. And so that's a bit frustrating and a little bit odd. Nonetheless, Pending patent is uh, property and uh, can be uh, monetized. Um, it's very common for pending patents to be licensed, for example, and sold. Uh, investors 
and is going to invest in your venture are almost surely going to be investing in a venture that has pending not issued patents. And so they're taking some risk that those patents will never issue, but they're extrapolating and looking at what the value is likely to be. Um, so I say that only because this comes up like in every meeting I have with every client, and it's important to consider. And one lesson to take from that is to start sooner and start um, the full patent process sooner. If it makes sense based on your strategic plan, you know, your cash considerations, and where the technology is in terms of development, and if you're really ready to file a full patent. Let me jump into a little bit about the process. Um, I, I told Rosemary, by the way, to make sure to give me a high sign because I get started and I could be up here for three hours. and <laughs> Five minutes? Thanks for um, the, the provisional is uh, not a, a necessary step, but it's a frequently taken step towards obtaining a patent. What's necessary to obtain a patent is to file a full or non-provisional patent application, which is what Kringle did in July, I think. Um, and he filed in the U.S. and he also filed internationally, which was, was, was a smart move. The provisional is a patent pending, which is stake in the ground. Um, and it, 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 uh, it, uh, multiple provisionals can be filed for relatively short money. So it's a great way to get a lot of your stuff pending. On the other hand, um, the, the patent application isn't examined until the full application is filed. So by filing a provisional, you're effectively delaying the issuance of your patent by whatever the pendency of the provisional is. Now, in Kringle's case, it made a lot of sense for all the reasons he described, and in many cases it does. But it's not a knee-jerk reaction. Don't assume provisional. I would go in and assume non-provisional and talk about with your attorney the reasons, uh, the, the best way to start the process. I'm going to massively run out of time, but that's OK. Um, uh, one important point from this slide, um, and I'm not going to talk about in any depth what a patent claim is, but the, the, the claim in a patent is the part of the patent that says in words what is owned. It's, it's the statement of the property right. It's akin to a deed for your house where you have lot lines, you know, your lot runs from this rock north by northwest for 180.34 feet. In a patent, there's these little paragraphs that describe what you own. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, um, again, it's a little bit of a fine point, but a very important point, is that it's important that your claims be written such that um, essentially that they're enforceable. Can you detect whether another party is going to infringe your patent? If your patent is on a method of chemically treating something that's done in the back room of someone else's factory, you've got probably no practical way to know whether your competitor is using that method. So is that patent worthwhile? Well, that's the strategic side of things. You decide early on, should we file? Or maybe should we keep that a trade secret or just pass on it and file on something else? Um, and you also have to be able to prove infringement, which is way beyond the scope of this um, talk. But it's important, I think, for you to have in mind when you're thinking about patents and dealing with your attorney to, to uh, discuss these considerations and do the best job that you can collectively to position your patent in these ways. Um, don't have time to talk about trademarks anymore. If anyone has any trademark questions, ask me after and be happy to help you. Uh, the only thing I would say, like copyright, trademark rights exist when a trademark is used in commerce. It's not necessary to register a trademark in order to have rights, but it's highly, highly desirable. Um, and it's not very expensive. So if you've got an important trademark, uh, without being too blunt about it, you're crazy not to register your trademark. Copyright, pretty much already talked about that. Trade secret, already talked about. Um, Kringle went through briefly the patent cooperation treaty that's 
This, the, the treaty is uh, very, very useful, highly important. Uh, you can think of the Patent Cooperation Treaty, in essence, beyond the initial examination, which is really important and helped Kringle's company out. What the PCT does, it's almost like an international provisional application. It delays the filing of the patent in the ultimate countries in which you want a patent for um, 30 months from the earliest priority date is called. So 30 months from the first filed application, which in Kringle's case was the provisional filed in July of 2013. So 30 months from then, he's going to have to enter the national stage of examination from the PCT, which means you take the PCT and file it in the patent office in each country in which you want a patent and pay the filing fee in the country, and then you enter the examination system that that country has set up. And they're not all the same, and the fees vary wildly, and it can get very, very expensive. But nonetheless, by filing a PCT, Kringle's company has the right now to file a patent application in every PCT member country, which there are around 150, 148, some, it, you know, changing all the time. Touched on this really um, in terms of the strategic side, um, and uh, it, it can be kind of hard to develop an IP strategy, but it's worth considering your moves strategically uh, for the reasons I said, and a very minimum, because these steps can cost a lot of money, and uh, you want to have good reasons to spend that money, particularly when your resources are going to be minimal, and they should all be going into R&D or and then sales or whatever. Another question? Alice. Uh, I thought someone would ask about Alice. So Alice was a Supreme Court decision last year that has put a damper on software patents generally, and they've been in a state of flux kind of for a long time, but this is not good news for software patents. Um, it certainly is in, in the process of invalidating many software patents, yes. And, and, but the appeals court came out with a recent decision last month that upheld the software patent under Alice for very explicitly stated reasons. So it's a, it's a moving target right now. I'd say if you're in the software field and you're, you're filing a patent, software is patentable. It's still patentable. What Alice said essentially is if you have an old known method that you just computerize, you write software to accomplish some known business method, say, that is not patentable. There has to be more of a technology hook than that. So I think the Alice patent was on a method of, I don't know, it was an insurance method or a hedging method or something like that. It was a method that insurance companies had used for a long time to hedge their investments. And this patent was on kind of an automated system for doing that same hedging. And the court found that um, it went too far, that it was essentially a play on monopolizing the automation of this known methodology. And they found that it was, that the subject matter itself was not patent eligible. In other words, it was not an invention. It's not that it was obvious or something, it's just there's no patentable invention in that, that type of computer software. Um, Okay, a, a point here that can be hard, a little bit hard to swallow is the, the second bullet. Um, you know, your business plan changes, your business changes, your IP is not static. Um, and you might have invested a lot of money in some IP, but really, if, if it isn't right for your company now and, it, and you think going forward is gonna continue and it's gonna continue to cost you money, then you need to sit down and make a decision as to whether, whether to continue to try to obtain the IP. Again, think of it as an asset, it's costing you money, is it gonna be worth the investment at a minimum? So prune when you need to. Um, I had hoped to talk a little bit more about um, licensing. Um, we're gonna hear about value extraction, that's essentially what licensing is, but. Let me just set the stage, maybe then I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, so as I said, IP um, can be 
sold or licensed. A license is like a lease. You're letting someone use it, and they're giving you some consideration for that. Um, most licenses are royalty bearing, where there's a right given to use, say, a patented invention, and the licensee pays, most times, not always, um, a running royalty percentage of sales. Uh, so for the licensee, it's like a uh, cost of goods sold, really. It's adding to their cost basis. For the licensor, once you have the license in place, it's cash coming in pretty much right to your bottom line. Um, licenses clearly need to be um, monitored um, and make sure that the licensee is being honest and that everything is, you know, above board uh, because a lot of games can be played. But beyond that, licenses don't cost the licensor much money and can bring in real cash. So if you have a dormant patent or you have some property that you could license to in maybe another field, or I'll give you an example of a client of mine recently licensed a patent um, or a portfolio uh, for, for some goods, um, and the licensee took the retail marketplace, and my client kept the internet marketplace. That's perfectly acceptable. So um, my client was in the internet, internet sales business around this product, it now has a licensee selling in big box stores. Um, might be a problem undercutting their price, but they'll, I think they'll figure that out. Um, and the company's gonna be getting checks every quarter um, on, for sales that it would, would never have been in a position to make, was not in its plan to make, and feels that it's not gonna erode their market enough to really make a difference. So think about all that. Um, I am out of time. So thank you. Um, do I have time for a couple of questions? Oh, Ed, that is a huge, big question. Um, and you're right, the institutions can really uh, be quite demanding in their, in their license agreements. Um, well, um, I have found that a, a, a big issue tends to be um, upfront payments uh, for, for smaller companies, startup companies. Um, and if they're not spun out of the institution, then they don't have that existing relationship that can maybe be leveraged into negotiating the license. So if I went to WPI to license a technology, um, they'd probably be asking for substantial upfront payment at a minimum to cover their costs. We talk about cost-based valuation of an asset. I mean, they, they want to at a minimum be made whole. Now they, they also need to make money. Um, they're not a cost center. They're supposed to be a profit center. Um, and that, that tends to be the most difficult uh, issue because um, royalty rates are usually, you know, more or less the same, you know, broadly speaking. Um, and it can be difficult to deal with that upfront payment. Um, if, if possible, break it down over time and, you know, and, and pay it out instead of one lump sum, pay it over the course of two years or maybe... Uh, load the royalties in a different way so there's a higher royalty stream at the beginning to, to make up for that money. But you're not gonna avoid, um, in a situation like that, paying at least enough money, the tens of thousands it's cost the institution to develop the patent portfolio. And it makes sense. They've created this property, you're gonna walk in and use it. You know, um, th there needs to be some, some substantial skin in the game. Okay, um, it, there's a wide variety in the laws in each country. Um, there, there's some in common. So each country will have its own laws that address each of those issues. But generally, patents last for 20 years from the filing date. So the term begins to run when the patent, the full patent application is filed, even though it takes maybe three years to issue the term runs from the filing date, which again is odd because the first, while it's pending, you don't have anything to enforce. So the effective term might be typically 
17 eight, or 18 years, something like that. Um, every country charges fees to maintain an issued patent. Many countries charge uh, an annual fee called an annuity. Uh, in the U.S., there are fees paid at only three times over the life of the patent. Uh, the first one in three and a half years from the issuance. So the U.S. system, I have to say, is uh, relatively speaking efficient and inexpensive, and the maintenance is tends to be much less expensive than most other countries. Uh, and if uh, an annuity or maintenance fee is not paid on an issued patent, the patent lapses and, and enters the public domain. In other words, you've lost the right. So. Uh, it's necessary to, to, to budget, I don't know if you, you know, I don't know if companies budget out 20 years, but it's necessary to be aware of and budget for the continuing costs of, of patents after the issue. Yeah, that's, um, it's a little bit complicated. First, I mean, it, just very broadly speaking, if, the in, if your trade secret becomes known, you can't unknow it. You know, if someone publishes your trade secret on the internet, uh, there's no way that I know of to unpublish it. So you, you certainly could have a legal action against that party if there was theft of trade secrets and there are state laws that really have some teeth in them that relate to uh, misappropriation of trade secrets. Um, and it can be possible if there's been a limited release to, you know, kind of undo that. But really to, to be, it, the information has to be secret in order for it to be a trade secret. So that's one of the problems with trade secrets. And it, they, they can be hard to um, keep under wraps. I've heard, for example, I don't know if this is true, but I, I've read that the Coca-Cola formula is, is only known by really several, in its entirety, by three or four people. And the company will not put all those people on the same plane. Right, and so that's that's literally the case, and that's the steps they've that you know that they've taken to protect their trade secret. Yeah.